Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, it is a pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks to Gilad and Sydney for inviting me here. Um, uh, I was in Spain a few years back. Um, it is very nice to be in this town, uh, beautiful town. Um, so today I'll be just trying to share some of the things uh, what we have been doing um, during the last several years. Uh, so I'll try to bring all the three things, what is happening, HPC, big data, and, um, and deep learning. Um, so as you can see, we are in a very exciting stage. Like uh, not only we want to make enhancements to HPC, but once we do to the HPC, big data people want to use it, then deep learning. So we're in a very cycle here, and that's why there is the convergence is happening in these three fields. But at the same time, not only we want to design this on a, like a dedicated systems, there is also an increasing need to run all these kind of environments in cloud. So that is also uh, coming as a newer direction. And the other dimension which is coming is that you want to run all these kind of application on the same infrastructure, okay? Now many, many places you see, okay, there is a separate HPC, there is a separate big data, there is a deep learning machines, but the question is, if we have, let's say, a typical cluster, we have some kind of a resource manager, the file system, can we run all these jobs concurrently? Not just MPI job, you can run Hadoop jobs, Spark job, deep learning jobs, so you don't need to replicate machines. Um, so how do we achieve uh, these kinds of things? So in that context, in my group, we have been working in this area for almost now 20, 25 years. Um, um, so I'll try to share some of our latest developments, starting with the traditional HPC side, and then I'll go into the big data, the deep learning, and in the end, I'll try to bring all these things together, saying how you can achieve that also in the, in the cloud. If we take a broad look, now we are talking about example of systems. Uh, how do you design, especially to support programming models? Okay, so if you take a look at the programming model, so typical HPC, we have the MPI, PGAS, uh, UPC, OpenSMEM, even CUDA, OpenMP, then we have the Hadoop, Spark. So these are the kind of things you can think of like the middle part, and end users are trying to program on top of these. And then below, we have the different kinds of technologies. So we have networking technologies, we have multi-core, many-core architectures, accelerators, GPU, and now the FPGA is also becoming uh, more important these days. A lot of systems are coming up. Um, so I call this like a supply side, in the sense these technologies are coming from the industry. Of course, innovations are happening there, but we need to take all the features and mechanisms of these technologies and support the programming models and then give it through some middlewares to the applications. So then the application people can just run and then get the best performance, scalability, fault tolerance, et cetera. And this is where the role of the communication library or the runtime comes in, okay, between the programming models and, and all these features. And my group especially has been working in this area for the, all the last 20 years, trying to see how best to design, provide support for point-to-point, -point collectives, energy awareness, synchronization locks, IO file systems, and uh, the uh, fault tolerance. And not only this is a layered approach, we can also try to do a lot of co-design. That is also becoming very important because if you just want to do a design at one layer, you might have some restriction. But if you are trying to design across the layers, then you have much more freedom, and then you should be able to actually come up with a better and better design. So, so then that will lead to very good performance, scalability, and uh, resilience. So in this context, let me first introduce the MPI project, um, which I've been working on my team. Um, this is called the Embahapage project. Uh, uh, some of you must be familiar with this. Um, we almost started this project when InfiniBand was born, like almost uh, in October 2000, 17 years back. Um, so prior to that, we were working on Mirinet, Quadrix, those kind of networking technologies. So when InfiniBand came, we were the very first ones to, to jump in. And we actually made the first MPI version, which was a rapid, which uh, supported MPI 1. It was uh, available in supercomputing 2002. That was the first open source version available. And then after that, we have been continuously enhancing it uh, to not only to the latest standards, but we have very specialized versions, and I'll be talking about that um, in the next few slides. Uh, so currently, this is being used by more than 2,800 organizations in 85 countries. So these are the based on voluntary registration. Anybody can download our software stack, uh, uh, but we have a small note in the download section. If your organization would like to be listed, then people provide that information. And uh, just from our site, we have crossed like 
425,000 downloads just from our site. Uh, but besides that, I mean, this is available in all different stacks of server vendors, network vendors. Uh, not only that, we have this, uh, during the last uh, 15 years, we have been enabling these systems, a lot of top 500 systems to come and utilize our stack. Um, so currently, actually, it is running on the number one system uh, in China. Uh, that's like the, the 100 petaflop system is being driven by MRAPIS2. Not only that, we have all these other systems, NASA, TAC, Tokyo Tech, a lot of systems in the top 500. And just to give a historical perspective, so if you see here, like some of you are familiar, the first InfiniBand system came into the top 500 was in 2003. Even though technology was introduced 2000, but the first system was, this was System X for, from Virginia Tech. So during that time, even we worked with them to make the first InfiniBand system is the top 500. And since uh, like 2003, uh, last 14 years, we have been working with all different um, organizations. Whenever some new system comes, they are having some issues, we work with them to push the envelope. And then we have reached all these number one system. Um, this just provides a very quick perspective of how the, the timeline and the downloads have happened. We are, as you can see, we are in a very stiff rising curve uh, of uh, people um, using our stack. Uh, but more importantly, this is the overall software architecture. Um, it's a very modular architecture. We take care of at the top, not only just MPI, but we also have support for PGAS, hybrid MPI, PGAS. I'll talk about that a little bit later. And then below, we have networking technology, not only InfiniBand, we support also iWork, Rocky, Omnipath. Here again, from the different uh, platforms, we support not only the traditional Geon, but Open Power. Mike, uh, the new KNL, NVIDIA GP GPUs, and also ARM. Just we introduced the support for ARM. So, so below these technologies and the architectures, those were the new kinds of things we look at, all the newer features, newer mechanisms, and then trying to see how do we design that intermediate layer, that runtime, and then link it to the upper layer so that the end users can take advantage of the best performance and features. So this is what we call like MHAP is to software family because the, the field is moving so fast. Uh, what we have done, it's in a little bit modularized version. So the basic MHAP is to is, is available for InfiniBand, OmniPath, Ethernet, IWAP, and Rocky. Then we have an MHAP is to X, which has some advanced MPI features. It also has that PGAS support. I'll talk about that later on, the PGAS and the MPI plus uh, PGAS hybrid version. We also have uh, with this, um, uh, there is a tool I'll introduce a little bit later that also is supported here. Then we have, there's a very optimized version for GPUs. And this is where we have been working with NVIDIA for the last several years um, to really take advantage of all the latest and greatest from NVIDIA technology. So that is available in this MRAP is to GPU Direct RDMA or the GPU version. Similarly, we also have a virtualization version purely for cloud. I'll talk about that towards the end. Um, some of the challenges and all we have handled there. Then we also have an energy aware version, because as you know, many people have been becoming very conscious about energy. So we have done some designs within the MPI stack itself at the protocol layer so that it consumes the less energy and you can have a good trade off in performance and, and energy. And then we had a version earlier for MIC, that is the Intel MIC architecture, and now we are gradually moving. There will be a new KNL version available soon uh, because the MIC is, is old, the KNL is new. And then not only we have the MPI versions, as some of you might also be knowing, uh, we also have an OSU micro benchmark. Um, so this also has started from the very day one of the project. So um, I look back in 2000, people didn't know how to really measure MPI performance. Uh, people knew how to measure application level performance, but at an MPI level, how does they, like a, each communication takes how much time? How do you measure properly? People didn't know. So that's what over the last um, 17 years, whenever we introduce a new like MPI feature, we also have a corresponding micro benchmark so that you can actually run those things and get a feel how different MPI stacks perform. You can do some performance comparison and then see how the internal MPI is, is working for you. And then two kinds of tools also we have worked recently. One is this OSU Inam, which is a integrated network monitoring, profiling, and analysis. So that means these days if you run a job, many times what happens, you see some performance, but you don't know what is happening where the performance is being lost. So we have done a very tight integration. So from an application perspective, you should be able to actually drill down in a visualized manner, saying this is my process, this is what happened in the network, this is how the contention happened. Um, so we have done a very tight integration of InfiniBand features 
and API features, and uh, it has a database support. You can actually keep the logs and uh, go back and then trying to see what exactly happened during that run, and whether it was a system issue or it was an algorithm issue, where you lost the performance, then you can keep on iterating and have the best design. Okay, so that is the issue now. And then uh, similar to the energy aware version, we also have introduced a tool uh, which will measure the energy consumption. Uh, so think of like it's a very complementary to the OMB. Uh, OMB gives the performance, but this OEMT gives you the energy information. So you can actually run your application with the library and then see uh, what kind of trade-offs you can have between the energy and the performance. So I'll not have time to go over all these things, but I'll try to touch several of these just to give you a perspective. And uh, I'll be here throughout the day. I'll be happy to talk to you if you are interested in some of the other things. So let me start with the MPI or the HPC side. So here I'll first try to um, touch some of the scalability issues, performance and scalability issues, what we have been focusing. And then I'll go into a little bit of the MPI PGAS, uh, the support for GPGQ. And recently we have optimized the MFS stack for open power and ARM. These are the architectures which are coming. So I'll try to um, touch those things. Now, one of the big challenge in the MPI design is the basic performance. Like whenever you have systems, let's say those of you who know the, um, the typical cluster deployment, the point-to-point -point communication matters a lot within the node and also across the node. So this is trying to show like over the years different kinds of um, technologies uh, on, on reasonable platforms. Uh, we do a fair comparison. So here you will see on the left-hand side is the small message latency. That means half of round trip. Um, so uh, here we have around like a one microsecond. And this is the large message latency. It's dominated by the bandwidth as we go into higher message range. And here you will see like this, the EDR and uh, the Omnipath, they are performing very similar um, in this region. And then the other one is the bandwidth. That means the rate at which we can pump data from one node to the other node. Um, so here you will see very interesting trend over the years, like this is the InfiniBand QDR, FDR, EDR. We are in this range now, um, around 12.5 gigabytes per second. Uh, if you do a quick multiplication by eight, you will see 100 gigabytes per second. So that's what we can achieve at the MPI layer. And then the bi-directional bandwidth is the, the 200 gigabits per second. That's what you can um, achieve. Now those are the basic performance, but then the next question is, how do we get the scalability? And this scalability is becoming very important, so I'll start going over different challenges. The first I'll try to uh, focus on job startup, okay? So many people don't realize that, but think of just like a car. You can have a very brand new car. If you cannot start, what is the use, all right? And that's what is happening on these large scale systems. If you talk to the people who are deploying in the very beginning, because these are very brand systems, it takes, like very recently we worked, like this is the TAC Stampede, KNL. So, um, so here if you can see, like this is a run which we took, this is the new Stampede 2 at Texas Advanced Computing Center. This is a total system, that time they had deployed like a 3,584 KNL nodes. There are 230,000 processes. So you're trying to bring 230,000 processes in your job startup. In the very first run when they're using, so this is the Intel MPI numbers. If you see here at 64K, even, even 128K, it goes to almost like a three minutes, four minutes, okay? In fact, prior to this, Thing, it was taking 40 minutes when this system started coming up. 40 minutes. Now just imagine, I mean, if you just want to run a job, it takes 40 minutes to start, so what are you going to do later on, okay? So this is a continuous direction we have been working, so now you can see here, like we have reduced to 22 seconds. By the time you go grab a cof coffee, your job has already started running, kind of things. And this is continuously we have been doing over the last 17 years, and that helps like to push the envelope and then have this deployment on large and larger scale system. A uh, similar kind of thing, this has been taken on Oak Forest uh, packs, that is the Japanese system using Omnipa, that is also the large scale system. So there you can see, uh, we can do an MPI init in just five, 5.8 seconds. Okay, that, that's the MPI init which takes most of the time. So what we have done, these kind of enhancements, um, I'll not be able to go into detail, but these are all available in our latest version. And not only that, what we have done is we have actually contributed some patches to Slurm. So if you are using the Slurm, uh, in fact, we have contributed the patches to Slum directly also. They have not incorporated it, but we have the patches available on our site. So you just take this, download our MPI and the patches for Slum, and it just gets applied very smoothly to the Slum, and you will see this kind of performance on, on your system. Okay, so I'll strongly encourage you to use uh, this kind of features. 
So then looking forward, so these are the kind of things what, what we are looking. One is called the dynamic and adaptive protocols, okay? So now typical MPI stack, um, I don't know how many of you know, like there are different kinds of two different protocols. One is called Eager and Rendezvous. How, how many of you are familiar with that? Okay, some of you who do the design. So typically, to, like the sort messages you send by Eager, large messages you send by Rendezvous. And any MPI stack has some kind of a parameter where you can move this around to match with the application. But then if you see, most of the designs, like the last uh, 20 years in the MPI has been, these, these can be changed, but it is all of them can be changed or not, okay? So you cannot say, okay, five of them use this parameter, five of you them use this parameter, that is not there at all in the MPI history, okay? But typically applications, when you write, you will see those kind of need, okay? So here I'm showing to give an example. So let's say there are eight processes. So these processes, let's say, need, they need eager threshold of 32 kilobytes. These one need 64, or these one need 128, these one need 32. Um, if you just do the default, let's say this stack is used, the default is 16 kilobytes, so then you will see it has low memory requirement, but there will be poor overlap and low performance and high productivity. You can do it manually. Let's say you take the maximum of these, so this is 128, so you change every threshold to 128 kilobytes. Then you will satisfy most of them, but then what is going to happen is your memory requirement will go up, okay? And this is also becoming important, as you know, as we are going into this multi-core era, number of cores are increasing, the total amount of memory is increasing, but if you do a math, memory per core is reducing, okay? So that means when you do a runtime design, you also need to make sure that your total memory requirement is also low. Because if I give you a good, like a good library, uh, but it requires like a big amount of memory, then you will not be happy. Because application people cannot run large scale applications. So this is where we are coming saying, can we make it dynamic and adaptive? That means can the runtime learn from the behavior of this application? And in this case, can it adjust? Like in this case, whatever the application needs, like 32 kilobytes, 128 kilobytes, just like what is needed so that the library is automatically adapting to it. Okay, and that's what we have done. In fact, this got the best paper award at the ISC in, in June. Um, so here, if you see the execution time, so using this scheme, um, an amber, you'll see this is our last bar. You get the best performance and also see the memory consumption. Compared to all other schemes, we are able to consume the minimum and also trying to give you the best performance. Okay, so that's the kind of direction uh, where we are heading. So this is not yet available in the public version in the release, uh, typically we, first do the research in six to nine months, we take that design and then put it into our stack. So you will see this support coming up soon. The similar kind of directions, what we are working is on the tag matching. If those of you are familiar with, with uh, MPI designs, many times at the lower level, you get unexpected messages. So that means um, the receiver is not ready, but the sender has sent the messages. So, so how do you handle that? So typically internally you provide a buffer, so these messages get stored there, and when the receiver has come, you do a match. That's what is called tag matching. But once again, the stack matching traditionally has been done in a static manner. They do not adapt dynamically to communication pattern. They do not again consider the memory overhead. So here, just like the previous example, we tried to have a scheme which can dynamically adapt or learn from the underlying um, uh, MPI communication. And that's what we have done. Um, this is like the, this paper again got the last year, IEEE cluster best paper nominee. So if you see here like a, the tag matching time, so this is the green uh, compared to these are the older solution, the, the yellow and the blue. And not only we are able to give you the best performance, but see the memory requirement of the greens. Negligible sometimes. So, so by trying to minimize that, that queue or the data structure, uh, we are able to give you the best performance also with the minimum memory requirement. So this is the, again the design which will be uh, coming up um, in, the, in the next uh, uh, releases. So these kind of things, in fact, uh, at a high level, um, I call it like a personalized MPI library. Think of like, mon most of you would have heard personalized medicine, right? So medicine, that is a big thing which is happening in the medicine field that not only you just have a generic medicine for your cure, but based on your DNA, based on your analysis, you can actually prescribe personalized medicine. So that's what I call it like a, this kind of designs will lead to personalized MPI libraries so that for your application, 
and on an underlying system, it will tune itself to, to give you the best performance, okay? Um, so, so that case, you can harness the complete benefits um, of the underlying system. So let me move ahead. The next things uh, in the MPI library, you know, a lot of things happen with collectives. Um, these are like the, the group communications, like broadcast, reduce, all reduce, all to all. And uh, as the system sizes are becoming larger and larger, there is a lot of focus there, how we can optimize those. If you don't optimize, then you don't get the good performance. So here we have been like, uh, this is a newer technology. I think might be Gilad will be talking. You might have heard of there is a newer technology called SAR. Um, so that is the collectives are happening at the switch level, within the switch. Um, things are happening. So we have provided an interface. It is already available in the latest MAP is two. Um, uh, we have a newer paper coming out in more on these on the supercomputing 17 has been accepted. So here you can see, compared to the basic MAP is two, if you use the MAP is two SARP, um, here, like these are some different uh, number of nodes, PPN, we can get benefits, not just at the, um, like a, this is a D dot all reduced time, this is a mess refinement AMR, we can give you good performance, even on a small scale, like a 16 node environment, you can also get good performance. And then we have gone to the next level, trying to do some kind of a multi-leader algorithms, okay? So think of like a, many times within the node, there are different designs, saying that if I use some shared memory, I can do very fast communication. Uh, but people have used, like within a node, you can have only one leader, which communicates to the other nodes, okay? That is the traditional design uh, other MPI stacks have. But as the number of cores are increasing, let's say you have 50 cores or 48 cores, if you just use one leader, that could be a bottleneck, okay? So the question is, can I have multiple leaders, just like what we do in our project teams? Uh, you cannot say like a one person managing 50 people, that is not effective. If you can have four people managing 50 people, it is effective. So that is the kind of the multi-leader design um, we have brought. So here you can see, by doing that, um, here it is like a Stampede 2, it is a 10,000 processes. Um, here you can see, um, even in the all reduce, uh, let's say 32 kilobytes, we can reduce the all reduce time by a factor of 2.4, okay? And here we are showing like this, the, this is the existing MFP2, this is our new one, and then the Intel MPI, we are trying to compare um, there. And uh, similar kind of things, then you see the benefits at the application, because that's the end goal we want to achieve. So this is a mini AMR application. So now you see on a 2000 core processes, um, we can reduce the execution time by a factor of 2.6, or even a, this is on a uh, PSC, uh, the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center bridges, we can get by a factor of 1.5x. Okay. So then the next designs, what, what we have been working on um, is uh, kernel-based designs. Uh, there is a, with most of the stacks, um, these days um, there is a module called CMA, cross memory attach. Uh, in fact, if you go 15 years back, we actually, from our group, we introduced the first kernel based module called LIMIC. Uh, and then people adopted that. There were a version called KNM for OpenMPI. Then gradually those ideas have been incorporated into the Linux kernel so that you have a CMA which does the big uh, um, uh, transfer in the kernel base. Um, so then the question is, Recently, so this paper actually was presented at the IEEE cluster a few weeks back. It was the best paper finalist. So the question is, if you do a kernel-based design or collective, in this case, um, different systems we are trying to show, KNL or Broadwell or Power, uh, this is a log scale. Um, so here you can see, this is the basic MAP is to our Intel MPI. This is the new design uh, we have done. It's almost like a five times better here, Broadwell, two times better, power eight, 10 times better. So if you take care of like trying to understand how the kernel modules are working, we saw that there is a lot of contention happening there. And then we came up with a better design to alleviate that. And then so that your collectives work uh, better. So this is like MPI scatter. This is the MPI B cast, similar kind of things. Uh, here you will see like a, uh, in the left hand uh, sort messages, you use the shared memory, but large messages you use CMA. So you can get almost like a factor of 1.54 kind of improvement. And all these designs are coming up in, in the next uh, few releases. So then let me try to show you a little bit on the, uh, the, how the PGAS uh, kind of environments. As I indicated, like this uh, partition global address space, uh, a lot of focus currently taking place uh, as we head into the uh, exa scale. Uh, MPI has been there. Um, I'm sure it will still continue to be there. Uh, whatever new system comes. But if you take a closer look, you will see the MPI is good for regular communication. 
But when applications are irregular, you can write in MPI, but it takes a lot of effort. And especially if your applications has uh, different load distributions, you might have a load balancing issues. For those kind of applications, um, the PGAS model is good. The PGAS tries to provide a shared abstraction. So in that context, you will see that it's much more easier to program those kind of things. So, so we have done this design. This design has been there since uh, 2012. So what we did is, within a unified runtime, uh, we call it like a UCR, Unified Communication Runtime, we support all these programming models. We bring all these programming models through the same interface. So from a network perspective, it doesn't matter whether the InfiniBand fabric or the Rocky fabric is handling a MPI packet or a PGAS packet, it doesn't matter. We try to give you the best benefit to, to all these layers. And uh, so we can directly write like a MPI jobs will run. Even PGAS, you can have pure UPC program or pure UPC++, pure open spin. But on top of that, you can actually do hybrid. You can actually write applications with MPI and OpenSMEM, MPI with UPC. So it gives you total freedom as an application developer to see what is the best mode you want to use to, to get the performance. And, uh, and I call this like a hybrid mode is like a, uh, diversity. You know, like in a typical organization these days, there is a lot of focus on diversity. If you have a team, doesn't mean that everybody should have the same expertise. Might be like five people have expertise one, uh, two people have expertise two, the uh, other people have expertise three. So it's the manager's responsibility is to see that how to combine these expertise together so that the team wins, not everybody wins, okay? Uh, individually win, but everybody as a team will win. So that's what we have been doing. So uh, let me explain um, some of the details here. Um, so we actually did some work along this line. So let's say if you have an hybrid MPI and PGAS runtime, and let's take an example of like a Graph 500, okay? Uh, Graph 500 is a good benchmark. A lot of people use for the, the Graph 500 top, top gra Graph 500 list, and it also has a lot of implication on other applications. If you go inside Graph 500, you will see a lot of irregular communication happens, okay? So, so there are some MPI programs for Graph 500. So this is like the, the, the light uh, green kind of things. There are other versions, but they don't scale. But then this MPI version, you will see it's not scaling. So then we analyzed it. Then we saw that some, it's not that the total program is bad. It is only some parts of the libraries was not good for MPI. So then we rewrote that part with OpenSMAN, okay? Then we stitched it together. So that means you can, now you can see there's a program. Some parts are OpenSMAN, some parts are MPI. And then we were able to run it on our hybrid MPI PGAS runtime, and you see the benefits. This was on Stampede, um, on 16,000 core, we can give you a factor of 13 improvement. Okay, not just few percentage, it's a factor of 13 improvement. So that's what it shows, like a different way of look, looking at the issue. And uh, we see that as a realistic effort, like as people move into the exact scale, it's not that you have an MPI program and then you need to totally convert it into open span. That, that may not happen unless it is a small, tiny benchmark. If, because if the MPI program had taken 10 years to write and optimize, it will take another 10 years to write and optimize for open span. Okay, that may not be realistic, but you can have this kind of a hybrid so that you can try to make the environments closer to the hardware. Okay, what the hardware provides, and you can see MPI runs well on some parts, PGAS runs well on some part, and then you put it together. And similar kind of things, uh, and, and this took only for a PhD student like a six months effort. It's not like we spent five years to do this. So, so this is much more realistic. If you have any application which is not scaling, we'll be happy to work with you and then see where to ex exploit these kind of uh, benefits. And similar thing we also did with a sort example here. Um, same thing you can see like a four terabyte sort, uh, we can do with the hybrid mode with, with half of the time. So then these are some of the recent work, uh, what we are doing, like uh, OpenSMEM, as you know, the, especially the KNL platform has AVX instructions, MC DRAM, that is a high bandwidth memory. These are the emerging directions coming. So the question is, how do you optimize the OpenSMEM library uh, with uh, these kind of uh, infrastructures? Um, so, sorry. So here we can see, like, we have done very um, steady study like KNL default versus KNL AVX instruction, AVX plus MCDRAM, and we also compare that with the Broadwell and see where the benefit lies. For some kernels, you see benefits. 
Um, here example like uh, this is the NAS VT, uh, we see some good benefits, around 30% uh, uh, benefits you see here. This is like a heat 2D kernel using Jacobi method. This is a heat image kernel, that is the best performance we see. Like kernel default, then you go into AVX, doesn't show much benefit, but the MCD RAM starts showing the benefits, okay? So you need to see then for what kind of a kernel, how do you take the features of the underlying system and tune it properly so that you get the, get the best uh, performance. So then let me move to the GPU side. There is a lot of actions are taking place, as you know, over the last several years. Um, so in fact, almost seven years back, we introduced the concepts of CUDA aware MPI. Uh, how many of you have heard of that term? Not many, okay. So let me explain it. So, so typically what happens is, if you have a GPU cluster, most of the time what you do, you do a CUDA mem copy first. Move to the um, host memory and then send the communication, okay. So, so that means the end programmer, let's say you are an application scientist, you need to understand CUDA, okay. And uh, how the CUDA works, uh, what kind of uh, uh, communication cost is involved. And that is like a, you may get reasonable performance, but it's not a high productivity. Like we are forcing these application engineers or scientists to understand what CUDA is, okay? So the question is, can we make it high performance and high productivity? That's how we started this concept, CUDA aware MPI. Uh, in fact, we had the first paper at IAC, um, uh, and, and then gradually all other MPI stacks have moved to that direction. So the idea is that the end users doesn't have to know about CUDA at all, okay? So if you're an end application person, you know how to write MPI program from host memory, you just change that to your device buffer. That's all you need to do. So you just need these constructs, MPI send, MPI receive at an application level. You don't have to touch CUDA. Now see the animation. Everything else, MPI library takes care. Okay? So you don't have to worry about anything, and this will lead to the high performance and high productivity. Okay? And that has been, so once we have the publications, initial publication and demonstrate the benefits, uh, NVIDIA approached me saying, why don't we take this design and push it into the MRAP store library. So for the last five years, uh, with funding from NVIDIA, we have been able to provide this kind of designs. Um, so in all our releases, uh, you will see not only we provide this um, CUDA aware design, but we take advantage of all the features, IPC features, optimized tuned collective, data type support, unified memory. So we are continuously working very closely with them. And uh, this tries to show some performance. Um, some of you might have seen this number. I'll show you the next numbers in in next few slides. So this is like, look at this number. So that means from a one GPU going over the network to the other GPU, we can do communication in 2.18 microsecond. Okay? The basic infinite band I showed earlier is one microsecond. Now you see this is 2.18 microseconds. Okay? So that is the kind of this library uh, tries to provide. Um, so not only you see a lot of benefits in latency, we also get big benefits in bandwidth, bi-directional bandwidth. And that shows a big improvement, like an application. So this is like a Humdi Blue molecular dynamics application. You can see compared to the basic MWAPIS2, uh, MWAPIS2 with a GPU direct RDMA, you can get um, higher performance. So in fact, we are working very closely. Um, next time, if you are in Switzerland, or if some people are from Switzerland, you will see uh, the weather forecasting in Switzerland is being driven by MWAPIS2 GDR stack. Um, so we have a three-way international collaboration taking place. Uh, with, uh, we work with uh, CACS and Meteo Suisse, who is the um, uh, meteorological organization, and then uh, our stack. So we have been continuously working for the last three years. So we try to push the, the very best um, MPI and all kinds of optimizations, and uh, then the Meteo Suisse people are able to optimize that and then deliver the best weather forecasting uh, in, in Switzerland. So then we are also working on, um, there is a newer technology is coming, if uh, some of you might be not be knowing, it's called uh, GPU direct async, or GDS. So, uh, so the whole idea is that even though in the GPUs these days, your uh, uh, computation is happening in the GPU, but when you do a communication, it is being done by CP. Does, do people know internally? Like you have, you give the things to the GPU, GPU does the operation, but when you say MPI send, the control still lies with the host. So this is the new directions to go that can I also offload that communications to the GPU? That's what is the newer technology, GPU direct async. So we have been working with, uh, uh, with NVIDIA on top of that. Uh, so this is this trying to show some benefits in this 
message range, like you can get a 25%, 14% improvement uh, uh, through, through this new paradigm. Now, this is the new number I wanted to show, this very latest number. So the, say earlier, I remember the MAPS to GDR, I showed 2.18 microsecond. Now we have brought it to even 1.9. We are trying to cut like even that, um, uh, um, uh, like a 0.3 microsecond kind of things. We have cut down. This is with the latest Pascal, uh, 300 GPUs with Intel Haswell. So uh, see the GDR performance, OK? Uh, in just 1.9 microsecond, we can move data from one GPU to the other GPU through, uh, through increment. We are also working along this direction. There is a lot of focus these days on new kinds of applications have come up called streaming. Um, so that means, let's say, think of all these sensors um, or even medical equipment. The data is coming there. Continuous data is coming, not just once. So that is the kind of a streaming application. So people want to move that data to the GPU and then start doing the processing. Okay? Not only to one GPU, you have to populate the, all the GPUs in the system. Okay? So this is where we are trying to combine two Technologies, one is from NVIDIA, the GPU Direct RDMA, then InfiniBand, if some of you remember, the hardware multicast is there, but it is unreliable. So we have brought these two things together, and here you can see the animation, how it works. So directly from like a host, whichever is collecting the data, we pass it through the CPUs, and then directly it goes to, goes to GPUs and CPUs, okay? So, so we have provided a very good uh, streaming support, um, and it minimizes also the use of PCIe resources. And uh, through that, in fact, not only it helps the, uh, uh, the streaming, uh, we also saw some good application in the deep learning. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, sometimes you can think of deep learning also has a broadcast, and that broadcast happens, a lot of broadcast happens. So you can think of it as like a mini streaming environment, and we are able to, you can see, um, kind of like a, in a pipeline manner, we can uh, have this, this kind of uh, support uh, in the underlying system. And we actually presented this at ICPB conference uh, just last month. And you can see like a, uh, for uh, this is a Microsoft Cognitive Toolkit, CNTK. Um, so you can see we can at an application level, we can give like a 15%, 20% benefit kind of things with uh, optimizing the things at the lower layer. So then let me move into the, these are the very latest we are working on the open power. Uh, and uh, Open Power is the newer platforms. ARM is also the newer platform. So we have enabled the support. This is on the, only on the host side. Um, so this is like an intra-node. Uh, you can see we get very good, like a 0.3 microsecond. You can do it. This is inter-node. Uh, that is the InfiniBand EDR kind of thing. So we get very similar performance to the x86. But this is the new one. Uh, this is like the Sierra kind of system. Uh, the, uh, sorry, the Summit system uh, in the Coral program. So this is NVLink and, and Pascal. <coughs> Uh, is coming. Um, so, so here you can see um, we are able to give, this doesn't have the GPU direct RDMA, by the way. This is the Power 8, not the next generation system. With GPU direct RDMA, we can optimize it. So the latency is around like, a, uh, these are like intra-socket and inter-socket. Uh, but see the bandwidth. This is the benefit of the NB link. We are able to go up to like 32 gigabytes per second within the, within the, uh, within the node. And inter-node is, is, in this case, is the ED, FDR on this system. Um, so this will be actually be available in the next MFS to GDR in a few weeks. Uh, we'll have the design so that you can run it on summit kind of environment there. And then uh, we have the formal release of like uh, the latest release we supported ARM V8 also. Uh, that is a new kind of platform which is coming up. Uh, so here you can see, again, there's an intra-node within the node. Uh, we are able to get it like a um, uh, small message latency of like a, a 0.74 microseconds, 740 nanoseconds, we can move data within the core. Um, and uh, um, so, so those are the kind of the very latest uh, in, the, in the HPC side. And let me just try to see what is happening in the other domains. Um, so here in the big data you see over the years, uh, people have been thinking uh, like the same, like people have been running the Hadoop Spark kind of a jobs, but uh, people have been running on Ethernet. So we started asking the questions that can we take advantage of the HPC technologies? Can we take advantage of RDMA features there or high performance storage like parallel file system? If we do these kind of redesigns, then how much benefits we can achieve? So through this, we are trying to provide a convergence through the HPC and, and big data. So, so here again, you will see the challenges are very similar, um, like the framework I showed earlier. But mostly you will see these are the stacks which were designed with sockets. 
uh, like these are running with TCP IP. So our first goal was to see, can we enable those into the RDMA? And that's what we have done. I'll show you some numbers. But once you do that, you will see you can also optimize at the upper level, OK? Uh, because these stacks were designed with slow network in mind. And now if you can enhance the, the low level network, you should be able to uh, get benefits at the upper layer. So this is the project. We call it high performance big data or high BD project. Um, so what we have done is we have these RDMA designs for Spark, Hadoop, HBase, Memcached. Um, if you go to this site, you should be able to download. And these are available for both InfiniBan as well as for Rocky. And you can also use the same stack uh, for Ethernet. Uh, you have some good optimizations. We also have good plugins uh, for Hortonworks, Cloudera, those kind of distributions. So you don't have to totally reinstall your environment. You can just use our stack as a plugin uh, for those environments. So here I'm just trying to show some sample numbers. Here you will see like a, this is the Hadoop 2 random writer, TerraZen. So it is running on the same platform. This is the TCP IP stack, like running over IP over IB, but this is our RDMA design. So you can see, you can get an improvement by factor of three, factor of four. This is RDMA Spark, uh, high bench page rank. So similar kind of things you see, 37%, 43% benefit. Uh, this is an application with uh, astronomy application we are working uh, with the SDSC. Um, so there again, at an application level, uh, you see the similar kind of benefits at a 21%. So next thing is, of course, the, the deep learning. That is the new field which is coming. A lot of people have been working scale up and scale out. Um, so these are all the work on the scale up. This is the scale uh, out. Of course, there are some MPI solutions. What we have done recently to propose a lot of co-designs so that you can get good overlap, you can get efficient large message communication, and then um, you can actually redesign the deep learning frameworks themselves. So one thing uh, here we have done is a couple of solutions. First, we have actually done a very tight integration with MIPS to GDR and Nickel. That is the Nickel library from, from NVIDIA to, to give a very scale out. And here you will see this is a CNTK. Uh, we are actually working closely with Microsoft with the, with the funding. Uh, you can get very good benefits with the, uh, with the CNTK and our design. Then we have actually taken CAFE, and CAFE we have enhanced um, to match with the underlying system. And this is, we call it like a OSU CAFE version. Um, so if you go to this site, you should be able to download. And here you can see we are able to scale it up to 128 GPUs okay, with, with, with good performance. So you can not only have a scale up within the node, but you can also go across um, and uh, uh, get the best performance. And then most of the deep learning applications, if you take a look, it's actually providing a very good opportunities for MPI developers in the sense traditional MPI stacks have been optimized, most of you know, for a small and medium messages. But deep learning is coming in a very big manner saying, I want to optimize a broadcast of 12 gigabytes of data. So that means you need to rethink how these algorithms need to be designed, and that's what we have done. These are like all the, you see, 192 GPUs, um, all these are like the Bcast, all reduce, all the collectives we have optimized and they're available in our MIPS2 GDR. So if you have running any deep learning application, if you just run it here, you should be able to see good performance. And uh, recently you can see like uh, these are some even uh, like Baidu introduced something, a Baidu all reduce uh, benchmark, trying to already design, saying that, okay, that is the best, but actually our design is much more even better. So this will be available in the next GDR 2.3a. Uh, we can actually compete and do far better than even the Baidu, 30 times better in the small messages and large messages around 11% kind of things. So that is the traditional MPI domain. Nowadays also a lot of deep learning is coming through the big data stack, like some people want to use the Spark. Uh, so that is the field we call like a deep learning over big data. Okay, so there are now the deep learning is bifurcating. One is the traditional MPI and then another one is the big data. So there also we have been optimizing um, so here we have a new TensorFlow design, uh, and, and here you can see like we can give you a, almost a factor of 2.6x improvement. So, so this is not yet released. We are working on that. Very soon you will see a TensorFlow design with RDMA coming from the group. So finally, let me just wind up. Uh, so these are the, all the dedicated system, but then how to try to achieve this in cloud? Okay. So in the cloud or in the virtualization, of course, has a lot of benefits, fault tolerance, job migration, compaction, but the question is, can I get the performance, okay? Uh, of course, nobody wants, I, I tell this, low performance cloud, nobody wants, okay? Because if you go to the cloud, you lose performance. But the question is, can we maintain the performance or get the high performance? 
So we have been working uh, with the um, SRI UV support for Mellanox on the infrared adapters. Then we have done a lot of designs. So now we have support for OpenStack, Docker, Singularity, all the kind of technologies, whatever is available. And that is available. We have the optimized uh, version library called MAPIS2 virtualization. Okay. Um, so if you do like this, so the, this slide will explain the thing. So let's say um, these are all running on the same hardware. So let's say this is the the light green is the basic MAPIS2. You can actually run it on any virtualized environment, but you will not get good performance because when the VMs are talking to each other, they don't have a knowledge of what is the underlying network. They don't have that intelligence these days. So we have added those intelligence at the VM layer. So, and, and then you can see that uh, this native, the, the rightmost thing is where you don't use virtualization at all. So this is like a bare metal. That's the best you can achieve, okay? So of course, there is a big gap between this, this, uh, the, the leftmost column and the rightmost, and the orange is our design. And as you can see, the orange design is actually come very close to the, to the, uh, to the bare metal design, just with 2%, 5% degradation. Okay? If you don't use that, if you use this basic MAPS2, you will see this gap is around 20%, 25%. And this is where you lose the performance. Okay? So, so through this design, this is like the, the earlier was on Chameleon Cloud. This is with Docker. Similar kind of benefits we can get, and the very latest is the singularity. We also provide that support. So we can actually give you very close to the bare metal performance. Okay, so a lot of new designs have gone there. And that is on the MPI side. We have also done similar kind of things with the RDMA Hadoop. Uh, this has not been released yet. Um, so you can actually put those RDMA Hadoop, RDMA Spark, not just on dedicated machines, but also on the cloud. And you should be able to get the performance. So with this, let me conclude here uh, what I tried to show. Uh, that the next generation systems actually need to be designed now with a holistic view. You cannot just say that, oh, this is only MPI I am optimizing, or only big data, or deep learning, because all these three things are coming together. So that's what we have been focusing here. I presented some of the approaches and results here, and, but at the same time, many other open issues need to be solved along this direction. And more importantly, I see, um, I don't know how it is in the Spain, but all over the world, and next generation HPC professionals also need to be trained with all these technologies. That is also, I see, a big challenge. Uh, because not many people know that all these things can be done. Uh, if, if more people know, or the end application users know the capabilities, they will be able to do better design of their algorithms and take advantage of the machines. So with this, let me um, uh, thank the, all the sponsors. But more importantly, these are all my heroes. Um, all the, what I'm trying to present here is like a, uh, overview of last 20 years of research in my group. And, and every time new people come, they build on the top of the others. Uh, so I just want to always publicly acknowledge all their contributions. But more importantly, I continuously look for more people. Okay, so this is an ever-changing world. Um, so since we are in Spain, if some of you are students here, uh, if you want to come and join my group, uh, please feel free to contact me. And uh, well, hopefully your name will be in my next talk slide. Okay. So with this, let me uh, conclude here. Okay, so if not, thank you.